So guys, one of the most important groups of muscles in the lower limb and one of the most commonly injured group of muscles in sports. Let's dive into the clinical anatomy of the hamstrings. Hey guys, Khalid here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. So when we're talking about anatomy, there's only one place to start and that is our 3D anatomy model. So guys, here we have the hamstring muscles, the main muscle group in the posterior thigh. Now we have three hamstring muscles. We have the semimembranosus, the semitendinosus, and the biceps femoris muscle. We can see that the semimembranosus muscle belly sits on the most medial side with the semitendinosus in the middle and the biceps femoris being the most lateral of the three. Now the hamstring muscles have a role in both hip extension, but also in knee flexion. Now, if we analyze the location of these muscles quickly, we can see that they clearly cross both the hip joint and the knee joint, which therefore helps us remember that they have this clear role at both joints. So now let's dive into the individual anatomy of all three of these muscles in more detail, starting with their origins. Now, all three muscles originate from the same place, which is the ischial tuberosity of the pelvis. Now, this area or this area of bone is sometimes referred to as the sitting bone, as if you sit down on a seat and you feel at that inferior pelvic region, you'll feel that particular bone being quite prominent. Now, in terms of their insertions, all three muscles insert into different places. Let's start with the semimembranosus muscle. Now, as we said, the muscle belly of this muscle is located on the most medial side of the posterior thigh. And when we look at its insertion, it's at the more posterior aspect of the medial tibial condyle. And we can see that insertion there. Now, this is where it gets really interesting between the semimembranosus and the semitendinosus because you'll be able to see that the semitendinosus actually crosses over from the semimembranosus in terms of its insertion. And we can see that the insertion for the semitendinosus is more located at the medial tibial condyle at the pezanserine region. So there we have the semitendinosus tendon inserting there. Then finally, we have the biceps femoris. We said that this is located on the most lateral side of the posterior thigh. And as you can imagine from the name biceps, this muscle has two heads. It has a long head, which is the main one that we talked about originating from the ischial tuberosity, and the short head, which we can see originating from the linear aspera of the femur, so much lower down than the long head. Now, in terms of their insertions, they join almost together at the head of the fibula. And here we can see with the muscles joined on that they branch together before inserting onto that head of fibula on the lateral side. So having discussed the detailed anatomy of these muscles, let's now talk about clinical anatomy. How does the anatomy actually relate to physiotherapy? Well, first of all, how do these muscles get injured? And it's really important to say that they are one of the most commonly injured muscles in sport. In soccer, it's been said that 37% of all muscle injuries occur at the hamstrings. So it's really, really important. So how do these muscles get injured? Well, the most common time you're going to see injury is when the hamstring muscles have to contract, but contract from their stretched elongated position. So this is going to be for sprinters who are having to really pace those strides out whilst really extending their leg. We might talk about soccer players when they're really stretching and reaching for the ball, as you can see with Harry Kane here. And another example that comes to mind is your NFL, American football players, when they're kicking the ball because they really have to demonstrate huge ranges of movement when they're doing so, as you can see here. Now, when we look at research from individuals such as Ernland and uh, Almeida Vieira from 2017, they highlight that the most commonly injured hamstring muscle is the long head of the biceps femoris. 
they talk about the fact that whilst it's not absolutely clear, it's thought that the second most commonly injured muscle is the semimembranosus muscle. But another really important factor that they do mention is that proximal hamstring injuries at the hip occur much more frequently than distal hamstring injuries at the knee. And to me, this really makes sense. When we think about that contraction from that elongated position that we talked about. Because when we look at those different individuals, such as the NFL kickers, for example, we can see that when they're really on a stretch, it's at the hip joint that we can really see that elongation in the range of movement. Look how much hip flexion these individuals are in when they're performing their movements. So it does make sense to me that proximal hamstring injuries occur more commonly than distal hamstring injuries. So next, does the location of the injury matter? Absolutely it does. Here on the screen, we can see a brilliant diagram from the research of McDonald et al. from 2019, looking at hamstring injury classification. And we can see that from this, when we have an injury to the myofascial part of the muscle, perhaps where the muscle belly runs close to the skin, the healing time is relatively quick at around three weeks. Grade B, when we see that the injury involves a little bit more of the tendon muscular fibers, so the musculotendinous junction, that healing time increases a little bit to four to eight weeks. However, when we have grade C injuries that involve predominantly tendon tissues, the healing time is a lot higher at two to four months. And therefore, if you can try to establish where on the muscle your athlete has injured, it can help you plan rehab a lot better. So finally, a quick tip, which is really important in terms of rehab. So we can see from evidence from Van Bijsterveld et al. from 2013, they did a huge systematic review on hamstring injuries, and they noted that one of the strongest risk factors for hamstring injury is when that athlete has had a previous hamstring injuries. And in fact, we know that the rate of recurrence for hamstring injuries in the first two years can be as high as 63%. That's absolutely massive and tells us that when someone injures their hamstring and doesn't go through proper rehab, they are absolutely likely to injure their hamstring again. And therefore, if you find yourself working with these athletes, that top tip is make sure they are really ready to go back to sport. We really want to be stressing that hamstring to the max before the player goes back to competition. So can we complete really robust testing to make sure that that player is ready? Have we given them enough rehab with high level, high intensity contractions in that stretched elongated position that we know creates those injuries? If we can get that right and make sure that the player is going onto the pitch knowing they're definitely ready, we're in a lot better position to prevent that re-injury occurring. So guys, if you've enjoyed this video, please support us by smashing that like button and check us out on Instagram at Clinical Physio. We've got loads of brilliant resources there as well as on our website, clinicalphysio.com. My name's Khalid. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.